The central tenet of information physics is that the concept of information is of fundamental importance in our understanding of the physical world, both in understanding existing physics, particularly quantum theory, and also in creating new physics. And the tenet is that information is at least as important as the concepts of space, time, matter, and energy that we're familiar with from classical physics, and, and maybe even more so. And this attitude now can be found permeating quantum foundations, quantum gravity, and other areas of physics. And so I think this, this, so information physics is then this umbrella term to capture this essential idea. And what I'm going to try to do in this talk is to give a sense of how this idea, this attitude has arisen, where it's come from, and where it seems to be taking us, and what insights it's already provided into the physics we know today, and how it's driving some of the research programs in quantum foundations. To do this, it's uh, almost, I can't see any other way to do it except to go back to classical physics and just to get it, just to remind ourselves what exactly is classical physics? What's at the heart of that? At the heart of classical physics is a mechanical conception of reality. It's this majestic view that everything ex that exists is matter in motion on the stage of absolute space. It's precisely describable and it moves, it, it has dynamics, it moves in time with uh, uh, quantitative universal laws of motion and it, these, the matter moves in step with some kind of universal time. That's the ontology and then the idea is that in principle we agents have unfettered access to what's going on. We can measure with arbitrary accuracy what's going on without in principle causing any disturbance. And there's also a promise that reality is so constituted that even though we as agents necessarily are restricted in making measurements on parts of the universe, parts of the totality of reality, we nonetheless can piece together the information we gain piecemeal and assemble it and, and can aspire to a complete knowledge of these universal laws of motion. So you see, it's a very ambitious and majestic picture that was created essentially in the hands of Descartes, Galileo, and Newton. And the sort of archetypal image really of Newtonian mechanics is this clockwork universe, clockwork model of the solar system. And essentially it's Newton's development of, these, of this conception into a mathematical framework that was so successful that essentially rooted this mechanical conception in, in our psyche, so to speak. And over the subsequent 200 years after Newton's Principia, um, this framework, this mechanical conception, provided the basis for the development of classical physics as we know it, by which I mean um, thermodynamics and electromagnetism. And it's interesting to see that each of these theories in some way stretched the mechanical conception. The thermodynamics seemed to threaten in some sense, I'll stand over here, seemed to threaten um, the, the idea that universal laws of motion are uh, deterministic and reversible, but then statistical mechanics in a sense rescued us from that. And electromagnetism introduced the concept of fields with non-countably infinite numbers of degrees of freedom, which in some other way also kind of stretched the Newtonian conception that what exists are corpuscles, which are necessarily discrete entities. So they stretched the classical conception, but at heart, they all were built within it. So when one stands back and looks at this, these classical theories, one can see this kind of basic structure. There's some underlying mechanical conception. There's something that I call here the abstract framework of classical physics. That's the basic abstract structure they all hold in common. And then 
you've got the theories, the specific theories, like Newtonian physics, thermodynamics, and electromagnetism, that are kind of built within that framework by adding specific information, saying what, what, what exists are fields, and they satisfy these equations, for example. So what is this abstract framework? Well, at the level of this abstract framework, we don't talk about matter per se, or space per se. We talk about systems. Systems which are represented by a point in state space, and where their dynamics are represented by a one-to-one -one map in state space. So this map is deterministic and reversible. Presumably, this represents t dynamics. So time is kind of implicit in this picture. And then we have a model of measurement. So we have the notion that when you perform a measurement, the measurement yields outcomes, which could be you know, a string of real numbers, for example, the positions and velocities of all the particles in the universe. And that, in principle, um, one can go backwards. That is, from the outcome of suitable measurements, one can actually reconstruct the state of the system. So, so the idea that there are measurements which are all seeing. They see everything. They tell us everything without causing any disturbance. So I think this is kind of the essence of um, the abstract framework when you're talking about a single system. And so here I'm summarizing the single system property. And here, composite systems, this is making the additional statement that if I have a system composed of many subsystems, for example, a box of particles, and I can think of each of the particles as a subsystem, then the state of the whole is specified by simply listing the states of the component systems. So looking at this um, framework, now focusing on, in on the uh, measurement process itself, because of the, these two properties of the measurement process, and because it's non-disturbing, in principle, every agent has a God's eye view of reality. Yeah, you and I may have different measurement devices, they may have different resolutions, so we may not be able to, in, you know, in practice, gain the same amount of information about a physical system, but, in, but that's a contingent fact. That's just because you and I lack the resources or have different resources. But in principle, at the level of the framework, there's nothing to stop us going as far down as we want to. That's really the promise that's being made in the classical picture, the classical framework. So what it means then is one of the, the consequences is that the concept of information is kind of redundant. We all have access to the same total information. We can talk about information, we can use the word, but it doesn't really add anything. And in classical physics, it's interesting that probability and information really only enter really at, at the level of data analysis when you're talking about fundamental physics. So it doesn't serve any fundamental role. Now, around this time in physics, around the time of sort of, sort of talking about the mid-1800s, uh, um, there's this stream that entered, I, I, I'm not sure exactly where you can trace it from, but from philosophy, from phenomenology and other places, this stream of operationalism entered. And the most well-known figure who expressed this way of thinking was Ernst Mach. And what Ernst Mach did is to really articulate a very different idea about what a physical theory is. I mean, I think the Newtonian conception was very much that the, the, the theory somehow represents what's really there. And we take it very seriously as a, as a kind of reflection or mirror of reality. What Ernst Mach did is to say, well, look, really what a physical theory is, is an economic representation of the, of the connections or relationships that exist between sense perceptions. That's really what it is. And if we read into a theory, the network of concepts that constitute a theory, any more than that, we risk error. So he made statements like this. The goal which it, physical science, has set itself is the simplest and most economical abstraction, abstract expression of facts. And he goes on to make cautionary statements like, you know, what we really do is, is to extricate a group of sensations from the totality of our experience and then attempt to clothe that in a theoretical structure which expresses the relationships between those sensations. And he, he's here kind of 
in a sense, telling Newton off. He's saying, well, look, um, suppose we were to attribute to nature the property of producing like effects in like circumstances. Just these like circumstances we should know how to find. We should not know how to find. In other words, he's, he's the very idea of a universal set of laws that operate at all times. He's really questioning that here, which is quite, quite a uh, you know, quite a cutting criticism. He says, nature exists once only. So he's saying that each time is unique. And so he's really questioning this very idea of universal laws. So our schematic mental imitation alone produces like events. In other words, it's only in our imagination that things are repeated exactly the same. It's only in our imagination. So you should be very careful about saying that these universal laws really, in some sense, exist. And what he did, uh, and he made some very cutting criticisms of the concepts of absolute space, for example, of Newton, what he did is to, at the very minimum, provide a way of thinking that helped physicists uh, out of a jam when it came to creating new physics. So, for example, Einstein, who described himself as an admiring student of Ernst Mach, um, essentially used Ernst Mach's way of thinking to, to some, somehow resolve the apparent conflict between the principle of relativity on the one hand and Maxwell's equations on the other. And as a result, as you all know, ended up revising the very notion of space and time and also matter energy. So this Markian way of thinking was very important for him. But interestingly, special and general relativity, although they kind of altered our notion of what exists, sort of space, time, energy, and matter, they didn't really change this abstract framework of classical physics, which I just talked about. That was left to quantum theory to do. And there, for example, Heisenberg, very, uh, in his writings, makes very clear just how important the operational way of thinking was for his creation of matrix mechanics. So quantum theory, um, perhaps the the best, the kind of, uh, the best way of illustrating the idea is electron diffraction. So uh, you would imagine if you think of an electron as a particle, it would uh, cast, it would have, you'd have a bright spot here and a bright spot here and a shadow here. But when, it, when you do this kind of experiment, you find something quite different. You find, contrary to all expectation, a, a bright region here, a very bright region here, and region here, and a region here. So you get this kind of wave-like behavior of electrons. And through a quite tortuous process that went over, that carried on over a period of about 20 years, quantum theory as we know it was created. And the formalism really is a substitute, it's a replacement of the abstract framework of classical physics. And this is the, the basic framework. I've here stated it for finite dimensional quantum systems. I don't think much is lost in doing that. Um, so states are now represented by n-dimensional complex vectors. So we introduce complex numbers, which is kind of perplexing. Why would you do that? Unitary transformations represent uh, dynamics. So now not just one-to-one -one maps over state space, but unitary transformations, which are, which are a very particular type of one-to-one -one map. And now this is the very striking thing, measurements now, even ideal measurements, even the very best measurements we could ever do, don't, are such that one cannot predict with certainty the outcome in, in general in an experiment. That even if you know the state of the system immediately prior to performing the measurement, you cannot predict with certainty what the outcome will be in general, except for extreme gen degenerate cases. And furthermore, the measurement you perform is disturbing. It's maximally disturbing up to repeatability. In other words, if I perform the measurement and then I perform the me measurement immediately afterwards, you'd expect to get the same result with certainty. And so in other words, once you perform the measurement, the subsequent state is completely determined by the outcome of the measurement itself. So the, the measurement, in a sense, just erases the history of the system. It it's kind of starts from scratch once after you've performed the measurement. And finally, this composite systems rule, which says that if you have system one and system two and you know their states, then the state of the whole system is given by 
this expression here, it looks innocent, but it has huge ramifications. So this is the abstract framework. Just to make this a little bit more concrete, let's consider some examples. So I'm going to consider the case of stern gerlach measurements on, on, on particles. So stern gerlach measurements, you can think of them as they're me measuring the magnetic moment of the system that comes. You think of a magnetic moment as a vector in three-dimensional space, so a fixed length. And a device like this is basically just, I mean, geometrically, it's just measuring the Z component of that vector. Right, that's all it's doing. And if you imagine you, you threw lots of particles of the same total magnetic moment towards a stern gerlach device, their magnetic moments will be oriented in all kinds of different directions. And so what you'd expect to see will be dots all the way from here to here, right? Sort of smeared out. That's what you'd expect to see. It's one of the most, I think, remarkable predictions of quantum theory that when you do this experiment on electrons, or rather silver atoms, their proxy, you don't see that. What you see are a splotch here and a splotch here. Doesn't matter if you rotate the stern gerlach device. Absolutely incredible. And what it means is you can replace the entire screen with just two detectors like this. And so if you run this experiment, you can basically summarize what you get, the data you get, as a bit stream, basically zeros and ones, or ones and twos, where one represents this outcome and two represents that outcome. So here now we're looking at the, the state that represents this system, and quantum theory predicts only the outcome probabilities, P1 and P2, of that measurement. So in other words, knowing the state, you're still uncertain about what the outcome will be. This is the ideal case. This is not because we're not good enough experimenters. This is, the formalism says this is a fundamental limit. And so the data is a bit stream like this. All that matters here is the frequency of outcome one and the frequency of outcome two. And then through the Bayesian inference process, you would infer a posterior over the, over the probabilities P1 and P2. And this is obviously generalized to N outcomes as well. And just to illustrate the idea of a repeatability and disturbance, if this is the system state to begin with, and suppose this measurement yields this outcome, the state immediately afterwards is given by this. It has to be in order to be consistent with repeatability. And so what it means is that once you've done this measurement, you know what the state is afterwards. So there's no point in doing a measurement afterwards because you know what the outcome will be. It'll be the same. So in other words, once you've committed and done one particular measurement, the only data you get is one, you know, you get a zero or a one, and that's it. You might as well, and then there's no point in doing more measurements on the system. So if you want to, for example, learn about P1 and P2, you'd actually have to have a very large number of systems all prepared in the same state somehow and perform the same measurement on each of them and gather the data together. So very, very different from classical physics. Another very important feature we can kind of read off from the formalism is the following. So this is the state here, and you'll notice that the outcome probabilities are given by P1 and P2, so that the data that you get, this bit stream, only tells you about these degrees of freedom. You know, it doesn't tell you anything about these degrees of freedom. Right? So if you wanted to learn about the whole state, if you wanted to reconstruct the whole state, it wouldn't be good enough just to do a stern gerlach measurement like that. You'd actually have to put it in different orientations and do some measurements like this, and some measurements like this, and some measurements like this, gather all that data together, and then you could reconstruct the state. So again, this is a feature we don't see in classical physics, where a single measurement is supposed to see everything, all of the degrees of freedom in the state of the system. And this generalizes to n dimensions very simply. So in summary, the quantum model of measurement has at least these properties that we can just read off the formalism. You have outcome discretization, at least of some measurements, and these are really the interesting measurements. I mean, Stern-Gerlach measurements on elementary particles is 
pretty elementary and fundamental. So the data is inherently discretized. This is not a discretization that arises because of finite resolution of measurement devices. This is somehow inherent. So this is kind of remarkable. And then the probabilistic nature of measurement outcomes, together with the fact that measurements cause this kind of extraordinary level of disturbance, means that if you perform a finite number of measurements on identical copies of a system, you only get, gain finite information about what the state was of those systems. So there's this kind of infinite gulf between the state, which is specified in, real term, in terms of real numbers, and the data. And that gulf, you just can't ever uh, breach that. So you, you, you're restricted to finite numbers of measurements. And there's this irreducible uncertainty about the outcome you'll actually obtain. And finally, complementarity, as I've said, means that more than one kind of measurement is in general needed to reconstruct the state of a system. So just putting these alongside, we have the classical model, where information is redundant at a fundamental level, and quantum measurement, where because of the properties of quantum measurement as expressed in the quantum formalism, agents have this fundamentally informationally restricted view, both about what the state was and what outcome will be obtained. And so the concept of information becomes really fundamental, both from the agent's point of view and in terms of comparing agent's state of knowledge. In general, their knowledge will differ, and that's not something that you can bypass according to the formalism. So what I'd like to do now is kind of back off. What, what I've done is to just take one thread and show you how the concept of information has very naturally arisen through an organic process of development of physics and talk about other strands, because there are many strands that have given rise to information physics. And I've just summarized a few, and I could, I could put a whole lot more here. So over here on this side, you have in a sense, quantum theory, the probabilistic interpretation of psi, you have complementarity, and those are things which have been built into the formalism, so I've already talked about them. And then there's a very important piece of work by Leo Szilard, who basically did an analysis of Maxwell's demon, and through a very interesting argument, came up with the idea that really, that information of the right kind corresponds to thermodynamic entropy. So he postulated that one bit of information corresponds under the right circumstances to K log two of thermodynamic entropy. So that, that piece of work has had a, a very big impact um, going forward. And then over here, we have you know, a development that you might say isn't really physics. What you would call it, I'm not sure, but mathematics engineering, I suppose, and we've heard a lot about this already. And the importance of this has been, I think, you know, huge. Um, this more obviously in the sense that for the first time, this nebulous notion of information received a very precise mathematical formulation. And I think the magic of Shannon's work is to show that you can formulate the notion of uncertainty in the form of a, a few axioms which seem rather simple and at the end derive a formula which is really not trivial at all. It's a great, there's a great deal of structure there. And obviously Jane's work is the one that really connected together this work here with a piece of physics. So the first time we see that statistical mechanics can be understood as an inferential theory, or rather inference applied to a very specific mm -hmm. physical problem. And that I think has had a very significant effect going forward. You say, well, could quantum theory be subject to the same treatment? Could we derive quantum theory in a similar way as a process of inference if we specify the appropriate conditions and constraints? And then there have been developments in space-time physics centered around um, black hole physics where the concept of entropy is entered in a very fundamental way, Bekenstein and Hawking, and work of Penrose and others where you start to say, well, maybe space is emergent from something more fundamental, something pre-geometric. And this again, sort of in, trying to say, well, maybe quantum theory, the formalism is in a sense more basic than space itself. That space is somehow an approximation to something. <laughs> 
And then here, I've just indicated the beginnings of quantum information theory and quantum computing. So here, the no cloning theorem, it, uh, basically you can't you know, copy uh, a state. Given a state, there's no universal photocopier that will generate two copies of the system in the same state. And quantum information and quantum computing, you can think of as really pushing this idea that, well, you know, computation and information transfer is a physical process. Let's see what happens when we try to encode information in physical systems. How do we do that? What constraints exist? What new possibilities arise? What about entanglement? What can that do for us? And that work, which has been going on now for something like three decades, has had a really profound impact on neighboring areas like quantum foundations and quantum gravity, for example. So uh, just a brief comment on a, uh, elaboration on a few things I've just said. Obviously, you've just heard about this. So this is Jane's understanding, reinterpretation of what Gibbs was doing. Uh, he was doing inference. Um, and Beckenstein and Hawking, um, just a toy, uh, dis quick discussion of this. So if you have a black hole of surface area A, they're basically argued one should associate an entropy, a thermodynamic, thermodynamic entropy to that black hole, which is proportional to the area and a constant. And this here is the Planck length squared. Right, so that entropy in a sense reflects the knowledge you've lost about the matter that's fallen into the black hole, which forms the black hole, because the matter is now, you don't have access to that matter, direct access. And you can give this an informational spin, you could say, well, imagine I have a black hole of surface area A, and let's imagine that this notion of continuum of space-time is, is, is a kind of an approximation. Let's imagine that there's a kind of minimum area of which you need to encode a bit of information. So imagine you try to write a number in binary on the surface of a black hole, okay? Um, and, you know, how many bits could you put in? And how, how, mu how much uncertainty do you have as a result of not knowing what that number actually is? Well, you would say, again, following Szilard, that the, the entropy calculated in this information theoretic way would be k log 2 times the number of bits, which is the area of the black hole over the, the, minimum, area, the, min the minimum area of the facet on the surface. And if you just equate these two, you get this interesting thought that there may be some minimum area, right, which represents the actual uh, sort of almost atom of area. And it's basically given by the Planck length squared times a constant. And it turns out that detail work in quantum gravity, loop quantum gravity, for example, in a sense, vindicates that actually generate, just by chance, it gives exactly the same formula, so far as I know. And so, I think the, the idea of the, the notion of information physics has been best articulated by John Wheeler, and he's summarized it in this lovely slogan called It for Bit. So he explains it as follows. It from Bit symbolizes the idea that every item of the physical world has at bottom, at a very deep bottom in most instances, an immaterial source and explanation. That what we call reality arises in the last analysis from the posing of yes-no questions and the registering of equipment-evoked responses. In short, that all things physical are information theoretic in origin, and that in this, in a participatory universe. So here, participatory, he's referring to the fact that when we make measurements, we change what we measure. So we're participating in the unfolding of reality. And here he's obviously heavily referring back to quantum theory, that in the end, at the most fundamental level, it seems that the outcomes are discrete. So hence, you can resolve all outcomes to basically yes, a series of yes, no questions. And he goes on to say, what we call reality consists of a few iron posts of observation between which we fill an elaborate papier-mâché of imagination and theory. It sounds very Markian, very, very Markian. I mean, 100 years after Mach, or, or so, 
what's different now is that Wheeler is saying these things having seen 100 years of physics pass by. So looking at space-time physics, looking at quantum theory, and seeing also, he was very impressed by Shannon's work. And uh, he, he, he was very impressed by the fact that you could get so much structure associated with this concept of information. And it really gave him hope that really you might be able to derive real mathematics by uh, thinking in terms of information. So, all right, so you have an idea, but um, you know, how would you implement it? How would you test it out? Uh, this, this basically is a program. Well, one of the obvious places to test it out is to say, well, can this help us understanding the structure of quantum theory? It's one of the most obvious things. And so going back to the picture of classical physics, the basic structure, what makes it comprehensible to us, I think, is this tripartite structure. You don't just have this framework coming in from nowhere. You have a very clear clockwork conception of reality. And when mathematized in a quite natural way, this gives rise to the abstract framework of classical physics. And I think, in a nutshell, why we find quantum theory so difficult to grasp is that when we think about quantum theory, where we really want to be is here. We want a quantum conception of reality, which, when mathematized, gives rise to the abstract framework of quantum physics or quantum theory. That's where we want to be. But we're not there. What von Neumann and Dirac and others gave us is this, without the benefit of this. And we don't have this conception, and we don't have this pathway leading from here to here. So one of the things you might ask is that, well, you know, could you take these uh, qualitative or features that you can read off the formalism, can you kind of do the kind of Einsteinian gymnastics of turning things around and take these as given for the time being, take these as given and somehow derive this formalism, right? If it is that possible, obviously we would expect to have to put in something more, but hopefully not very much. So if we could do that, that would sort of to some degree vindicate this whole informational perspective on physics. So one of the first people to do this, so far as I know, is, is uh, one of um, John Wheeler's students, uh, William Wooters, who has since become, he's made seminal contributions to quantum foundations and quantum computing and information. So what he did is to consider a very simple situation to get started. So what he said is the following. Suppose that Alice wants to communicate an angle in a plane to Bob. He wants to communicate the angle, sorry, Alice wants to communicate the angle theta to, to Bob. Classically, she could just prepare you know, a system, a, a vector in space, and simply send that to Bob. All right, that's what she could do. She could write it down. She could represent it in some way and send it to Bob. But let's suppose that we don't allow her that, and we force her to use quantum systems in order to communicate this information. So what she does is she takes her Stern Galactic device and she basically orients it at some angle theta phi. So she just basically encodes essentially the angle in the, the, the physical, the macroscopic device itself. And then what she does is she sends silver atoms through this device and she selects those that yield that outcome which I call up by convention. She then sends these spins, these silver atoms, I should say, to Bob. And Bob then does an analysis using his stern Galact device, which he just orients up and down in the z direction. And we know from the formalism of quantum theory that the probability of him getting this outcome is p1, this outcome is p2. And it's going to be a function of theta. Okay. So, so let's look at what Bob will get. He will get some kind of bit stream data like this, and he could use Bayesian inference to infer a posterior over P1, P1 and P2. So let's look at what Bob would think. He thinks to himself, OK, the probability of, of me getting up is some function of theta. My data is this. This is the frequency of up, frequency of down, given that I've analyzed n. Uh, spin and silver atoms. His inference would be through Bayes' theorem. So the posterior 
over theta, given the data and his theoretical model is given by this expression. And now one could say, well, how much information does he gain as a result of analyzing n spins? Well, use Shannon entropy, uh, Shannon Jane's entropy. So you end up with this expression here. So it's, I got this wrong. Sorry, this is the probability of theta comma dn. Com so this is the posterior log posterior over the prior. So now we could say, all right, we know what this function f of theta is. For electrons, it's cos squared theta over 2. For photons, it's cos squared theta. So we could just put this in and do the sums. But now Wouters does something very interesting. He says, let's suppose we didn't know that. Let's suppose that nature is constructed in such a way that it's kind to Alice and Bob, that in some way it's the best of all possible worlds that it allows optimum communication from Alice to Bob. What function f of theta would maximize how the amount of information that Bob obtains in the limit of an infinite number of spins? So that's the question he asks. And as you can see, he's not putting in anything except you know, probability theory and, and information theory at this point. When you do the extremization, you get this. You get the cos squared form, where m here is a positive integer. In other words, it includes the electron and the photon as special cases. So you get a family of solutions. And when I saw this, I was completely hooked. I, for me, this is, even though it's a small result, you might say, this is, this is not the quantum formalism by any means. It's one very specific prediction of quantum theory. Nonetheless, it's incredibly clean because he doesn't use anything strange. He uses probability theory and Shannon entropy, and that's it. And one single, very natural, intuitively natural informational principle. And so the question is, well, could you, could you beef this up somehow and derive the whole of the formalism? It turns out you can, but it's, 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 it can be done, but it's, it's, uh, you have to introduce a lot of extra ideas to do that. But anyway, I just thought I'd show you this because it's it, in a capsule, it kind of illustrates this informational thinking. So the, our, the, the hope would be, let's try to derive all of the formalism using similar kind of ideas. And over the last 25 years or so, there's been a growing interest in doing just that. And um, so the idea, there have been many different informational principles proposed to try to reconstruct quantum theory. They have different flavors. One of them exploits the idea that, quite remarkably, quantum theory allows for non-local correlations, but on the other hand, doesn't allow for faster than light signaling. So in other words, there's this curious sense in which non-locality and no signaling coexist peacefully, as Abner Shimoni said. And some physicists, Popescu and Rolich in 1983 proposed, well, maybe we could use this as a principle to derive quantum theory. Let's, let's throw that into the mix. Let's take that as a given. So you can think of that as an informational principle of some kind. Another principle used more recently, um, again, has a similar flavor. That is to say, well, yes, there is, there are, there is entanglement. There are non-local correlations. Um, but on the other hand, given some arbitrary entangled state, you can reconstruct that state by performing measurements locally on the separate pieces and gathering together, collating together all of the data. So this is uh, another principle that you might posit right at the beginning. And there are many, many others. Um, so it's a very fertile area and very active right now. What I'd like to do to finish is just to sketch work I've done recently with John Skilling and Kevin Knuth to derive Feynman's rules of quantum theory. Um, I picked this, well, because I did it, and also because it, there's a the remarkable co connection between this derivation and the derivation of probability theory due to Cox. So it's quite, and we were directly inspired by that derivation. So. What are Feynman's rules? Feynman's rules are, in a sense, a, uh, abstracted from the normal quantum formalism. Um, and in a sense, they're, they're a subset of the formalism of quantum theory. So 
very roughly, uh, we would say that a particle moving through space-time from point A to point B in classical physics follows some trajectory, and that trajectory is given by the principle of least action or something like that. And what Feynman says is, look, if, you, if this is a quantum system and you want to do a quantum model of the system, and all you do is a measurement here and a measurement there, you really don't know which path it took. So in some sense, you have to consider all possible paths. I've just drawn a few of them. And the prescription, the recipe, is that you have to assign a complex number, an amplitude, he calls it, to each of these paths. And then you compute the total amplitude to go from A to B by adding those complex numbers together. That's the sum rule of, probability of Feynman's rules. Then you can compute the amplitude to go from here to here by multiplying the amplitude associated with this piece and the amplitude associated with that piece. That's the product rule of Feynman. And finally, you have a probability rule. So you have a way to connect this theoretical level of description of amplitudes with probabilities. So the probability of B given A is proportional to mod C squared. So these are Feynman's rules of quantum theory, and you can write this in state form as well, in forms of states. And then this goes over to the Born rule, for example. So that's our target. Our target is to derive Feynman's rules of quantum theory. The, the reason to this audience should be obvious, given all the talks we've had, that this looks very much like probability theory. I mean, it's not. But we have a sum rule like the sum rule of probability theory, you have a product rule, like the product rule of probability theory, and then we have something strange, something we, we don't see in probability theory. So the question then is, could we adapt Cox's style of reasoning, his style of derivation, to derive this? And our work um, basically is a kind of inspired most directly by Ariel Katic's work and Noel Tukaczynski, uh, who tried to do just this. Um, and we were just trying to take it one step forward. So just to illustrate how these rules work, so let's go back to the electron diffraction example. So uh, we have these two paths, as it were, through these two slits. These represent the measurement devices. So we're measuring which slit the particle goes through. And we would say the probability of doing this is P1, the probability of doing this is P2. So if we have this particle-like ontology, if we think of a particle as a localized ball of energy moving through space, it can only go through this way or this way. So the probability of going from A, A to C is given by P1 plus P2. Okay, of course that's wrong. So Feynman says what we should be doing is if we have a measurement device like this, which merely tells us that the system went through the slits, but is non-specific about which slit it went through. And it, we're not even talking about which slit. It simply went through the slits. It went through the region of space occupied by the two slits. What we should do instead is take the amplitude Z1 and Z2, add that together, add those together, and then compute the probability P for going from A to C. And this is the relationship between P1 and Z1, P2 and Z2, which implies the probability to go from A to C is given by this expression here. So you get this interference term. So this is the wave-like picture. So we, we cover the wave-like behavior from these rules. Now, Feynman talks a lot about imagining a classical trajectory. So it's a kind of, his whole language is a curious mixture of operational language, measurements, outcomes, but also he's using classical notions which we know are not valid. So it's kind of asking for trouble to sort of mix those two ideas together. And it would be much cleaner from an operational point of view to never really talk about what happens in between measurements, to not ever talk about trajectories and restrict our attention to this measurement was done and this result was obtained. This measurement was done, this result was obtained. So we want to operationalize. And again, I go back to stern gerlach measurements uh, as an example. So we imagine a box, an evaporator, which gives you a steady stream of silver atoms, and you feed it through this device, and you get this detector fire, or this one. And I'll symbolize the outcomes like this, one and two. 
I'm also going to allow the possibility that we fuse those two detectors together, which corresponds to in the electron slit diffraction of having just one big detector, which just tells you, look, the system went through the slits, but I don't know more than that. So we consider an experimental setup like this, which is the analog of the electron diffraction problem. So we get this outcome. We might get this one here and then this one here, which we symbolize in this way. Or we might get that outcome. We symbolize it like that. And what we would like to do is, at a theoretical level, to connect together the description of these two sequences of outcomes with uh, the outcome we get in this experiment where we coarse grain over the detectors in the middle. And so we get a sequence like this. And now we want to kind of formalize our, our hypothesis that, these, that the description of the first experiment determines the description of the second experiment. So we do that by introducing an operator, the parallel combination operator, which just which says, so we say that this sequence formally is A in parallel with B. So now we're introducing these logical operators, just as Cox, he was able to use Boolean algebra. We're kind of inventing or using, inventing these things. It follows immediately from this definition that this is a commutative operator and also that it's associative. So I can combine these two sequences together to get that and then combine that with the with sequence C to get this, symbolized like this. But of course, I'm at liberty to do the combination in another order, in which case I would symbolize it like that. And of course, they represent the same sequence. So we have this equality, associativity. And now we introduce a second binary operator. Um, so we, we've got this notion of concatenating experiments. and we introduce this dot operator to symbolize that. And this is two is associative for the same reason as before. So we can combine this in that order, in which case we get that. Or we can think of this as B dot C combined with A, symbolized like that. And so we have associativity. And finally, we have a distributivity property, very much as, again, as in Boolean logic. So imagine this sequence, consider this sequence here. We think of this as A in parallel with B. And now we imagine combining that in series with C. And if we do that, the result is symbolized like so. But we can also think about that as A in parallel with C at the, at the top and B in parallel with C at the bottom. And then, sorry, A in series, A, A series C in parallel with B series C. And so here we have right distributivity, right because the dot is to the right of the parentheses. Correspondingly, we have left distributivity. So what we have here really is a, a, a logic, a logic, a way of combining together experiments or uh, measurement sequences to generate other sequences with a set of symmetries. Again, very much like Boolean logic. So now we play the trick that Cox did. And we want to quantify over these sequences. So what we want to do is we've got a logic, and we want to find a representation to generate a calculus. So what kind of representation do we want? Well, here physics enters. At least my present understanding is that physics is required here. And that is we use this notion of complementarity, which I already referred to. And the way we formalize this in this very minimalist framework is to say, for every sequence A, we represent with a pair of real numbers, A1, A2. And the idea is that through a function little p, that determines a probability, which is the conditional probability of obtaining M2 and M3 as outcomes, given that M1 was obtained. I won't go into the details of why this is the natural choice, but it, but it is. So now we just run through the process of representation. So now we just go through the process that essentially Cox did. The only thing is now we're dealing with pairs of real numbers. That's the only the difference. So we introduce the O plus operator, which I just skipped through too fast, and the O dot operator here. And so what we have is the logic 
on this side gets represented over here in, in this form. So these relationships on the right-hand side implicitly define O plus and O dot. So we have a set of functional equations. The only difference, again, here is that we're dealing with pairs of To now make progress, we need to make a requirement that this probabilistic calculus we're developing is consistent with probability theory. It yields the same answers as probability theory whenever probability theory is applicable. Okay? So consider a situation like this, a sequence M1, M2, and M3. We can apply our formalism so far as it exists so far to the situation. We assign a pair A and that corresponds to probability P of A, and likewise that. And then we can say, oh, well, the pair associated with that is A O dot B, and that yields probability P of A O dot B. We can also analyze the situation using probability theory. There's, there's nothing to stop us doing that. And if we do that, we find that probability tells us that there's a relationship between these things. It's a simple product relationship. This, too, is a functional equation, which you can solve in each of the five cases that I showed you. And you can derive the function p in each of these cases with up to some, over, some constant which we need to determine. So we end up with these five solutions. And these two solutions can be eliminated at this stage because the calculus, which is supposed to be a pair calculus, which, you know, um, formalizes this idea of complementarity, it's degenerate. It basically degenerates to a scalar calculus. So we can, we can dispense with these right away, and we're left with three possibilities. And so how do we, how do we zero in on this one, and how do we fix alpha equals two? Well, one way of doing this, which Kevin Kuduth and I worked on uh, just very recently, in fact, is, is the following. We say, well, look, I'm, just, I'm putting numbers here to be concrete. So just imagine the probability here is 1 8th. The probability here is 1 8th. Now, OK, so what happens if we just you know, uh, put a big detector here? So what's the transition probability from A to C, which I'm formalizing and writing down as P subscript 1 2 here? Sorry about that change in notation. So this represents the transition probability from A to C in the case where you don't know you can't say go through this slit or that slit. Well, classical probability theory plus the assumption that the particle is some localized entity would lead you to say, well, that probability is one quarter. What we might say is that this new calculus should have the property, so should, so we say we're postulating it has the property that sometimes it will say more than a quarter, sometimes it will say less than a quarter, but we want the maximum and minimum possible values to be symmetrical about one quarter. So let me show you a graph. So here is the case that the probabilities are both one eighth. This would be the classical answer, the classical answer. You making use of probability theory plus the classical assumption of localized particles. So you end up with a, with a quarter here. Now this is a function of alpha, so that's and this is case C1. This is the complex case, but where we don't know alpha. And these are the maximum and minimum possible values that you can get from our calculus as a function of alpha. And this is the, the, their average. And you see that this intersects precisely with alpha equals 2. So alpha equals 2 is very special. It's the value of alpha at which the maximum and minimum possible deviations of the uh, 
P12 computed using this calculus are symmetrically oriented about uh, the classical answer. And it turns out the symmetric bias condition eliminates cases two and three. So it eliminates all but the complex case. So this is uh, basically, this really concludes the derivation of Feynman's rules. So in our notation, this is the sub rule, the product rule, and the probability rule. And so you have a very natural explanation now for why complex numbers, why modular squares, it all falls out of this analysis. And as you can see, we're just basically following the Coxian way of proceeding, of building up formalism from a logic by quantification. Philip, Philip uh, does this, is this a, like, a, like a new postulate that is natural for it to be Exactly, right, so it's a, it's a postulate, yeah. And, and um, this is something we... Is it really natural? Oh, I don't know, right. Yeah, well, you might say it's, it's again, a kind of symmetry condition. And so there's another way of doing it, which is what we did in our paper a couple of years ago, which didn't involve that. It was much better, much more complicated, but it was natural. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, we three disagreed. I thought it was very natural, but my, my co-authors disagreed. So we carried on going, and we found. But the nice thing about this, I think, this way of seeing things, is it shows that the relationship between probability theory and quantum theory really clearly it shows that quantum theory is not incompatible with probability theory at all, which I see so much in the literature still. Uh, so it shows that, no, quantum theory is entirely compatible with quantum <coughs> probability theory whenever probability theory is valid. And in a sense, it extends it. It gives a prediction when probability theory is not applicable. And it has a very special relationship with the classical prediction. So it gives a, a different kind of insight. And in reconstruction, I think we need many paths. And we don't know which one will be fruitful in the end. And it turns out that one can then go from this to derive the rest of the quantum formalism in a normal von neumann dirac form. And one can derive the tensor product group using exactly these kind of symmetry arguments. It's actually very straightforward. And one can derive the Hermitian representation of measurements, unitary evolution, and the temporal evolution operator without, with an absolute minimum of new assumptions. In fact, to get these, you don't need any new assumptions beyond what I've already said. So the implication then, standing back, is that the abstract quantum formalism really is a formalism for the consistent manipulation of information gained from measurements under the twin informational constraints of probabilistic outcomes and complementarity as I formalized it. Um, so I think it's quite helpful to see, I mean, here are many interesting properties of quantum theory that have been studied since the 1920s. Entanglement, no cloning, uh, more recently, non-locality, contextuality. From the point of view of this reconstruction, this is really all you need, plus the relationships in this logic that we've put in. And you get out all of this. I think it's kind of remarkable. We didn't use um, notions of space here in any fundamental way to get things like you no know, signaling and non locality. So, one thing that you might want to say here is okay, so what? What does this tell us about the nature of quantum reality? Worth saying. Um, classical physics, the deterministic assumption of classical physics means. The future is causally closed, by which I just mean the present state of reality is supposed to determine the future state of reality. From that point of view, the probabilistic nature of measurements is not fundamental. I mean, this is because of our limited resolution uh, of measurements. It's because of agent lack of knowledge. So the only understanding of probability you would have in this, this universe, in this kind of deterministic universe, would be uh, Probability is a quantification of degree of belief of an agent in something. But at the ontological level, there is no such lack of knowledge. In the kind of what I'm calling the process view, because it's kind of pro inspired by a stream of called process philosophy, amongst others, is that the future is actually causally open. The present doesn't determine the future. The present constrains the future, yes, but doesn't determine the future in every detail. So, for example, if I have the proposition, proposition A, which says it will rain uh, over the Waterloo Inn on Monday, 
That proposition is not objectively true nor false at the present time in this view. It's neither true nor false. On Tuesday, it will be true or false. It will have been the case that it will have rained or not. In other words, there are assumptions that built into classical logic which presuppose some kind of ontology. If you have time-marked propositions, it depends on your ontology whether you'll accept that they're objectively true or false at any time. So in this, in this view, you wouldn't accept that. You'd say, no, it's not a matter of the fact. It's not tr the proposition is neither true nor false now. However, it will be true on Tuesday, which means something's objectively changed, one might argue. And so one then is led to the idea that the passage of time is not some kind of artifact of our own limited consciousness, as it would be in the classical physical f um, framework. It really is an actual physical process. It actually involves an objective change in reality. And I call it the process of actualization, kind of citing Aristotle's terminology. So from this point of view, the probabilistic nature of measurements is simply nothing but a mathematical quantification of the openness of the future, the causal openness of the future, as Abner Shimoni called it, an, a quantification of objective potentiality. And interestingly, I was looking at Abner Shimoni's, one of his papers where he talks about his view, and he said, I can't see how to turn this idea of objective potentiality into a mathematical formalism. But we here know that, in fact, if you just take Cox's mathematics, the same mathematics applies. You can define probability as a quantification of a degree of belief if you want to, but you can also qu uh, quant uh, define it as the degree to which a proposition now determines a proposition at a later time. The same mathematics applies. The same axioms apply. So you can reinterpret Cox's formal, the probability formalism in support of this point of view. So probability in this view is incredibly natural. So why complementarity, which is the other interesting feature we used? Again, here, complementarity isn't fundamental. Measurements see everything. There's no obvious reason why a measurement would only be able to see some degrees of freedom in the state, not others. But in this view, you see, passage of time involves actualization. It's a real physical process that happens as time unfolds, as reality unfolds. And so from this point of view, complementarity, in a sense, is a discovery we have made as physicists about the process of actualization. And I think that's very much how uh, Bohr thought about complementarity. It was a discovery we had made about something very basic in nature, a very basic process. Bohr talked very much in terms of measurements, and that bothers people. Um, I would say, again, following uh, process philosophy, that measurement is a kind of, when we use the word, we're restricted to talk about measurements we do. But rather, in, in this view, actualization is going on all the time. It doesn't require humans with consciousness making measurements. This is a process that's ongoing in nature. So I think this is how one could get to some, build some kind of understanding of complementarity. Finally, just, just a quick word about space and time. What about that? Um, one implication of the reconstruction is that the quantum formalism in, in the abstract form isn't really about space and matter. We didn't use the metric of space, topology, dimensionality to derive the formalism. Okay, we didn't talk about property of matter. We didn't even talk about locality or no signaling. So it seems that the quantum formalism is, has a kind of status comparable to the status of probability theory. It's a very austere mathematical structure which has minimal input from physics, has some input, but certainly not about the properties of space and matter, it seems, at least not explicitly. And so a working hypothesis, which is inspired really by the discovery of the fact that there are these non-local correlations in nature, which have been experimentally detected, you know, verified, is that space-time as we know it in this, this fundamentally local type of structure is emergent from a more fundamental pre-geometric substrate like Penrose's spin networks that I mentioned before, for example, so that non-locality and locality are really kind of extreme special cases. 
and that in particular locality as we have it from classical physics is really an approximation and this is you know this this is a uh, in a sense represents a the driving force for a program in quantum gravity and you know so it is actually driving actual creation of new physics at this time finally a couple of references I would like to point you to these two papers describe the reconstruction of Feynman's rules and I have other introductory articles uh, you, know, you know introductory articles talking more the kind of conceptual level as well on my website thank you very much for your attention Well, I'd like to thank you very much too, Philip. I didn't wave any time flags in front of you because I felt that as chairman it would be wrong of me to interfere in any way with the talk of such depth and authority. Uh, it was uh, fascinating to me. It's been an extreme privilege, in fact, to be involved with stuff like this. This is one of the great joys of this meeting as I get older. Uh, younger people are coming along and taking the torch and moving it forwards it is great anyway that's personal uh, do we have any questions from the audience your talk is uh, extremely fascinating and one of the angles uh, i'd like you to address is the question of intelligence so um how the framework would somehow um affect the idea that if we build the representation of the world, it will have to be of the same nature. It would be, sorry, it would have to be the same nature as? As based on the same ideas, based on the same, okay. same ideas, so that would support, a, um, support the idea that uh, probability theory is really the right way of approaching problems of artificial intelligence. Of artificial intelligence? Um, I'm not sure what to say there. Um, I mean, I, I think that it's, I mean, I, I find it, in a sense, this kind of work, I think, in some sense, so also supports the fundamentality of probability theory. The fact that we can just de derive a fundamental physical theory um, by, taking quant by taking probability theory as the kind of backbone, um, I think lends a great deal of support to probability theory. Um, so I'm not sure exactly what, what you're asking or whether I'm really answering that question. Oh, the, the other end of the question. The other end is, mm -hmm. uh, is uh, if uh, probability theory supports uh, a theory of reality as a theory of the world, a physical theory of the world, uh, why should the, uh, the right approach to study the nature of intelligence, which is obviously something that is trying to address the, um, uh, to, mirror, to mirror reality? I, don't, I, I mean, I suppose my point of view is that I think my point of view for many, many years has been that a proper understanding of quantum theory, by, me, by which I mean uh, reconstruction from minimal compelling assumptions, is kind of a prerequisite to really understanding properly things like the nature of life and the nature of intelligence. I think I'm somewhat alone on that. I don't think that we are even close to an understanding of those phenomena yet. And... Um, so I think we need to understand, we need to build an ontology, a way of thinking about nature, even this very basic level first, and that reconstruction of quantum theory is a prerequisite for that. And then we can better understand what life really might be, what the essence of life might be, what the essence of mind and intelligence might be. Um, so I don't really have more to say than that. Uh, I might suggest myself that the message of this seems to be that anything consistent we do has to be in line with probability in the epistemology and it has to be in line with the standard quantum formalism in the ontology. Anything else would run foul of very basic symmetries. But how complicated we build our models and what we try to model would be open to the future. Uh, uh, a question regarding uh, measurements. How measurements are represented in uh, your framework? Uh, are they included in constraints of uh, maximum entropy or in private functions as Gaussians? Oh, I mean, it, the, the representation of measurements is incredibly primitive as 
it, that is to say, it's very minimalist. We just treat measurement as a black box, which when an, a system is input, yields one of n possible outcomes. Um, and also, uh, as it were, the system is output as well. So it, it's an absolutely minimalist picture of what a measurement is, it's just like a black box. So no assumptions need to be made of the kind that you're saying about the nature of the, the measurement uh, device. So it's a, it's, this is very common in this, uh, the reconstructive approaches that, I'm, that I mentioned in the recent literature. It's a very minimalist uh, operational framework. Yeah. I have two questions, one technical, one broader. The technical question is this. The logical Boolean-like rules that you get imply a structure that involves addition and multiplication, basically. Um, so key to that is that you make is where your A's become pairs of real numbers, and then there are very few things that you can do at that point. So the technical question is, is there a motivation for having pairs of real numbers? And if so, is it explicable quickly, or should we talk offline? The broader question is, in some sense, what you want to go after here is getting something like the Schrodinger equation out of a simple um, information theoretic argument. Right. And do you mm -hmm. see any kinship between what you're doing and Eric Verlinde's program to get to gravity as an entropic force? Okay. So those are the two very those, those different two, kinds of okay. questions. All right. So question one, why, why pairs? Th the direct inspiration is complementarity. Uh, the idea at the very primitive level is a kind of two-ness at the level of the theoretical description, but there's a kind of oneness at the level of what we get out of a measurement. And you know, complementarity, it's almost like, so, so that, this is the, the very basic idea uh, behind that. And so the Are idea- you of two or just that you have more than one? Well, that, that, that you have two. And it's, that there's a two-ness there. If you look at the writings of Ball, this is very, very strong. There's a kind of polarity. Of course, you know, this is taken as an assumption. So what you won't like to do, and in fact, I've been trying to do it, um, which is to try to say, well, okay, what happens if you choose an arbitrary n-tuple? Do, does the logic admit arbitrary n-tuple solutions? Um, and my hope, and it's still I'm working it out, and I hope to do it soon, sooner rather than later, is to show using theorems from number theory, like Hurwitz's theorem and so on, that in fact you're restricted to very few. I hope you can restrict it to one, two, four, and eight, and then I can rule out four and eight using symmetry arguments, so we'll f of one and two. And then maybe I can rule out one with something. So in other words, but hope for- yeah, yeah, Octonian, Octonians are crazy. So, so I think that's, so one, one, two, and four, I think is no problem. And then the trouble is adapting these theorems. They make all kinds of, like Horace's theorem assumes that you've got this norm. And we don't have that here. So, I mean, how do you adapt a theorem like that to a situation like this? But that's the hope, that you could actually derive complementarity from something even more basic. And that, that would be the, that would be really nice. Um, Going back to the, the second point, deriving the Schrodinger equation, I mean, you'd ask two related questions. So you'd like to derive the Schrodinger equation. Um, let me just say that, um, so what we end up doing is deriving the abstract von Neumann formalism for, for finite dimensions. If you allow me to write down the infinite formalism by magic without deriving it, then it turns out it's actually, I've shown in previous works, actually very easy to derive the Schrodinger equation on the assumption that you know the classical Hamiltonian. If you do, you could derive the commutation relationships for position momentum, and then you're one step away from getting the Schrodinger equation. I don't find that very satisfactory because you're having to bootstrap off the classical model. I mean, Ariel, for example, has got a way of doing that, which doesn't. So, you know, there's work to do there to actually get the Schrodinger equation. That would be really nice to do that using inference and, and minimal assumptions from from classical physics. But one way or the other, it seems that you need to make use of the fact that you know what the energy function looks like in terms of the classical variables. And it seems either in either approach, you somehow need to bring that in. And then maybe that's unavoidable. Maybe that's telling us something. And is uh, there any feedback you get? Have you looked at Trilente's stuff on gravity as a tropic force? Right. So, so did you see that as sort of in the same family of attempts, or do you think it's qualitatively different? Well, OK, so, um, yeah, so Yes, I know about Flinders' work, his paper, and he gave talks at Perimeter, in fact, so I was privileged to actually see him in, in the flesh and hear what he had to say. His 
way of thinking about entropy is really very, very different. Uh, uh, it's I more. I think entropic <laughs> gravity is probably getting a bit off the point. Okay. Yeah, All right. Offline. There's a couple of questions here, which hopefully. Do you think that quantum theory could be just a theory of inductive inference with no ontology at all? Sorry. Do you think that quantum theory could be just an inductive inference theory with no ontology at all, like statistical mechanics is uh, from the perspective of James? Well, y y that's a very good question. And let me put it like this. When I first encountered quantum foundations as an area, I was very much put off by interpretations of quantum theory, which take the formalism as a given and then straight away try to infer some kind of ontology. And I always felt that that was short-circuiting something, that that's not the way to proceed, that you, you, you're not gonna, you're not gonna be on firm ground if you do that. So I see why I was attracted to reconstruction in the first place as a program, is that you take the formalism and you try to distill the essence of that formalism into a few compelling physical principles. And the, the great benefit of that is you uh, temporarily don't ask about ontology. You say, look, I'm just going to stick to the bare facts. Measurements happen, outcomes happen, and I'm just going to posit principles which seem reasonable in some sense, to somebody at least. And I'm going to try to reconstruct quantum theory. And one could stop there. One doesn't have to ask about ontology. However, if, you, and as Einstein said, you know, imaginative constructs of the human mind seem to be important and, and kind of necessary to develop physics, I do think it's important to go down to the ontology level because I think then that will suggest other directions. For example, this reconstruction, to my view, to my mind, very strongly supports the emergent space-time program in quantum gravity. So, you know, that's the kind of potential impact that, it, that asking for the ontology can have on physics more broadly. I think as human beings, we need more than bare formalism. One needs something like a co coherent conception of reality. We need that kind of organizing framework, not only to develop physics, but also to connect together to other areas of human experience. So, one more last question, I mm -hmm. think, from Robert. And then OK, a, a, a very quick question. Mm -hmm. um, there's a bit of a dichotomy in your talk. Um, in the early part of your talk, you talked about information and entropy and right. so forth, and then later on you gave this quantum formalism which was more or less associated with probability theory and, and right. outline to mm -hmm. it. And, and, but you mentioned earlier uh, John Wheeler and so forth and, and it from bit and, and so forth. Um, my question is, uh, what is the connection between probability theory and information theory? Is one more important than the other? Is one subsidiary to the other or not? Um, could we have an it and bit from prob, rather than uh, just mm -hmm. it from bit, which seems to me very circular. So, so that's okay. It's very interesting because you've put your finger on on something very interesting here, and that is um, the first reconstruction of quantum theory I, I attempted was to take basically Wouter's result, which uses Shannon entropy as a key idea, and to try to beef it up to actually derive the whole of the formalism. And it used a principle of information. It used probability theory and information mm -hmm. theory, Shannon entropy to be precise, in order to derive the formalism. And, you know, I always thought they were both necessary. And, but then, but I was al always very interested in, in the derivation of Feynman's rules by um, Tukhachitsky and, and Ariel Katicha. So that was always in the background. But uh, the question is, how do you avoid the assumption of complex numbers at the beginning? That was always the big question. And, and then, you know, to, to, my, to my surprise, it's actually possible to derive the formalism without ever actually using a quantified notion of information, without using it. So this does lead me to think that probability theory is some sense more, more basic, but you know, I don't know. Um, that's, I think, how we've thought about it for a long time, that probability theory is more basic and then information theory is at some, it's sort of a derived notion. Um, so I, I kind of support that view, I suppose. Right, well, let's thank our speaker again. We, we are running late, but I'm sure you appreciate there have been excellent reasons for that. And we'll readjourn in 19 point naught minutes at quarter to five.
see any kinship between what you're doing and Eric Verlinde's program to get to gravity as an entropic force? Okay. So those are the two very there's, there's different two, kinds of okay. questions. All right. So question one, why, why pairs? The direct inspiration is complementarity. Uh, the idea at the very primitive level is a kind of two-ness at the level of the theoretical description, but there's a kind of oneness at the level of what we get out of a measurement. And you know, complementarity, it's almost like, so, so that, this is the, the very basic idea uh, behind that. And so the Are you idea- thinking of two or just thinking of more than one? Well, that, that, that you have two. And it's, that there's a two-ness there. If you look at the writings of Ball, this is very, very strong. There's a kind of polarity. Of course, you know, this is taken as an assumption. So what you want to like to do, and in fact, I've been trying to do it, um, which is to try to say, well, okay, what happens if you choose an arbitrary n-tuple? Do, does the logic admit arbitrary n-tuple solutions? Um, and my hope, and it's still I'm working it out, and I hope to do it soon, sooner rather than later, is to show using theorems from number theory, like Hurwitz's theorem and so on, that in fact you're restricted to very few. I hope you can restrict it to 1, 2, 4, and 8, and then I can rule out 4 and 8 using symmetry arguments, so we'll have 1 and 2, and then maybe I can rule out 1 with something. So in other words, hope for... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Octonian, Octonians are crazy, so, so I think that's... So 1, 2, and 4 I think is no problem, and then the trouble is adapting these theorems. They make all kinds of, like Hurwitz's theorem assumes that you've got this norm. And oh, we don't have that here. So, I mean, how do you adapt a theorem like that to a situation like this? But that's the hope, that you could actually derive complementarity from something even more basic. And that, that, would, be the, that would be really nice. Um, going back to the, the second point, deriving the Schrodinger equation. I mean, you'd ask two related questions. So, you'd like to derive the Schrodinger equation. Um, let me just say that um, so what we end up doing is deriving the abstract von Neumann formalism for, for finite dimensions. If you allow me to write down the infinite formalism by magic without deriving it, then it turns out it's actually, I've shown in previous works, actually very easy to derive the Schrodinger equation on the assumption that you know the classical Hamiltonian. If you do, you could derive the commutation relationships for position momentum, and then you're one step away from getting the Schrodinger equation. I don't find it very satisfactory because you're having to bootstrap off the classical model. I mean, Ariel, for example, has got a way of doing that, which doesn't. So, you know, there's work to do there to actually get the Schrodinger equation. That would be really nice to do that using inference and, and minimal assumptions from, from classical physics. But one way or the other, it seems that you need to make use of the fact that you know what the energy function looks like in terms of the classical variables. And it seems either, in either approach, you somehow need to bring that in. And then maybe that's unavoidable. Maybe that's telling us something. I mean, and uh, is there any feedback you get? I mean, have you looked at Trilente's stuff on gravity as a tropic force? Right. So, so I mean, did you see that as sort of in the same family of attempts, or do you think it's qualitatively different? Well, OK, so, um, yeah, so yes, I know about Flinders' work, his paper, and he gave talks at Perimeter, in fact. So I was privileged to actually see him in, in the flesh and hear what he had to say. His way of thinking about entropy is really very, very different. Uh, uh, it's more. I think entropic <laughs> gravity is probably getting a bit off the point. Okay. Yeah, All right. Offline. There's a couple of questions here, which hopefully. Do you think that quantum theory could be just a theory of inductive inference with no ontology at all? Sorry. Do you think that quantum theory could be just an inductive inference theory with no ontology at all, like statistical mechanics is uh, from the perspective of James? Well, y that's a very good question, and let me put it like this. When I first encountered quantum foundations as an area, I was very much put off by interpretations of quantum theory, which take the formalism as a given and then straight away try to infer some kind of ontology. And I always felt that that was short-circuiting something, that that's not the way to proceed, that you, you, you're not going to, you're not going to be on firm ground if you do that. So I see why I was attracted to reconstruction in the first place as a program, is that you take the formalism and you try to distill the essence of that formalism into a few compelling physical principles. And the, the great benefit of that is you uh, temporarily don't ask about ontology. You say, look, I'm just going to stick to the bare facts. Measurements happen, outcomes happen, and I'm just going to posit principles which seem reasonable in some sense, to somebody at least. And I'm going to try to reconstruct quantum theory. And one could stop there. One doesn't have to ask about ontology. 
However, if, you, and as Einstein said, you know, imaginative constructs of the human mind seem to be important and, and kind of necessary to develop physics, I do think it's important to go down to the ontology level because I think then that will suggest other directions. For example, this reconstruction, to my view, to my mind, very strongly supports the emergent space-time program in quantum gravity. So, you know, that's the kind of potential impact that, it, that asking for the ontology can have on physics more broadly. I think as human beings, we need more than bare formalism. One needs something like a co coherent conception of reality. We need that kind of organizing framework, not only to develop physics, but also to connect together to other areas of human experience. So. One more last question, I mm -hmm. think, from Robert, and then Okay, a, a, a very quick question. Mm -hmm. um, there's a bit of a dichotomy in your talk. Um, in the early part of your talk, you talked about information and entropy and right. so forth, and then later on you gave this quantum formalism which was more or less associated with probability theory and, and right. aligned to mm -hmm. it. And, and, but you mentioned earlier uh, John Wheeler and so forth and, and it from bit and, and so forth. Um, my question is, uh, what is the connection between probability theory and information theory? Is one more important than the other? Is one subsidiary to the other or not? Um, could we have an it and bit from prob rather than uh, just mm -hmm. it from bit, which seems to me very circular. So, so that's... Okay. It's very interesting because you've put your finger on, on something very interesting here, and that is um, the first reconstruction of quantum theory I, I attempted was to take basically Wouter's result, which uses Shannon entropy as a key idea, and to try to beef it up to actually derive the whole of the formalism. And it used a principle of information, it used probability theory and information mm -hmm. theory, Shannon entropy to be precise, in order to derive the formalism. And, you know, I always thought they were both necessary. And, but then, but I was al always very interested in, in the derivation of Feynman's rules by um, Tukhachitsky and, and Ariel Katicha, so that was always in the background. But uh, the question is, how do you avoid the assumption of complex numbers at the beginning? That was always the big question. And, and then, you know, to, to, my, to my surprise, it's actually possible to derive the formalism without ever actually using a quantified notion of information, without using it. So this does lead me to think that probability theory is some sense more, more basic, but you know, I don't know. Um, that's, I think, how we've thought about it for a long time, that probability theory is more basic and then information theory is at some, it's sort of a derived notion. Um, so I, I kind of support that view, I suppose.